Our next chemistry topic, it's good to start there, our next chemistry topic is uh, using carbon fuels. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of this one, there are a few things that I just need to go over. Uh, they're not explicitly in the syllabus, but you do need to know them in order to understand what's going on with this topic. I've just given them a black background just so you can tell when we get back into the content for the uh, actual exam. So what we need to get happy with is um, the different ways of representing compounds. So whenever I'm talking about chemicals, I can either draw a picture where I represent the different atoms with different colored circles. I could give the name or I can give the chemical formula. And all of these three things here represent water. All of these are carbon dioxide. In this case, I've got two lines because it's a double bond. Uh, and here is a triple bond. You've just got to get happy with seeing all these different representations and knowing what they mean, particularly the formulas here. So note, I've got one carbon atom here, then I've got hydrogen, and in the little subscript underneath, I've got four of them. So when the four is small and after a letter, it's telling you that you've got four of those atoms. So in water here, it's saying that we've got hydrogen and then there's two of those and then we have one oxygen. So here are my two hydrogens and my one oxygen. Now, if I wanted to say that I had two water atoms, I'd put a big two at the beginning because that then tells me that I've got two of everything that comes after. The small numbers that are lower uh, subscript tell me how many I've got of the atom that came just before. You've just got to be really careful you don't mix those two up. So um, here are some other ways of showing the chemical, chemical formula. And it shows you how many atoms are in it. So here we've got sodium chloride. And its chemical formula is NaCl. So that's telling me that for every one sodium atom, I've got one chlorine atom. So I can see how many atoms are involved in each of these molecules. So I can figure out what's going to happen in reactions. So the next one is potassium iodide and then potassium nitrate as well. And again, it tells you how many are going on. Don't worry, you're not expected to remember what any of these are. So the K here is, stands for potassium. Then it tells me I've got one nitrogen, which you can see from the model as well. Then I've got three oxygens, one, two, three. So the names just tell you exactly what's going on with them. We can then use this information when we're doing when we're looking at chemical reactions. So here is an example of a chemical reaction where I've shown you the atoms involved. So here I've got magnesium oxide plus two lots of hydrochloric acid, which goes to make magnesium chloride plus water. Now I have to have two lots of hydrochloric acid because I have to have the same number of atoms in my product, so on the left hand, uh, sorry, in my reactants on the left hand side, as I do in my products, which are on the right hand side. So you just have to watch for that. It's called balancing equations. So I could write it as a word equation. Oh, my M fell off the bottom there, but never mind. So I'd have as a word equation magnesium oxide plus hydrochloric acid goes to magnesium chloride plus water. And then as the formula equation, it would be MgO plus 2HCl. So see when I do the formula, I put more information in, um, which goes to MgCl2 plus H2O. So another example, what it's just to do is just pause the video a second and see if you can figure out what the formula equation would be. I don't expect you to know the names, but you can certainly have a guess. But see if you can figure out what the formula equation should be for this. I'll give you the names first. So it's magnesium plus copper sulfate goes to copper plus magnesium sulfate. Then the formula equation would be as follows. Hopefully you got that. Now, as I said, we need to be able to balance these equations. So here's an example of an equation. Sodium plus water goes to sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen. So here are the molecules for it. But this doesn't balance because if you look on the left here I've got two hydrogen atoms but on this side I've got three hydrogen atoms so this equation doesn't work this reaction can't happen so what I have to do is try and balance it and what we do to balance them is just add molecules at a time until we manage to get something where I have the same on both sides and it ends up having to look like this now these take a little bit of practice and um, so the best thing to do 
is practice. It's just a matter of you add a couple of each or you try adding one more of each molecule on the left hand side then one more on the right until you get to where you have to go. So I've just given you a list of unbalanced equations here. What I suggest you do is now hit pause and have a go and see if you can put any numbers in to balance them. Now you might need to put numbers in front of one of the things in your equation or you might have to put numbers in front of more than one. This is quite hard and the only way you get there is practice. Okay, I'm going to reveal the answers now. So there they go. Just check and see how you did. If you didn't get them, don't panic, particularly as they get harder as I went down. Um, we'll have a chat about this in class, but it's something you just need to be aware of. Okay, so moving on to the things that are actually explicitly on the syllabus. Uh, you need to be able to make decisions about choosing fuels, and you need to think about what factors might influence that decision. So the first question you need to ask is, does it create pollution? Because obviously we'd rather use fuel that doesn't create pollution. We need to know how much it costs. I don't want to spend more than I have to on my fuel. I need to know how much energy it releases because it might be that um, it might be cheaper, but I need you know cheaper per kilogram, but I need more of it to get the same amount of energy out, so it ends up being more expensive or more difficult to store. So the amount of energy it releases. I need to know if it's toxic because obviously I don't want to be using a toxic fuel because this could have repercussions for our health. And then the final factor to consider is, is it easy to use, store and transport? If it's a pain to use, people won't want to use it. So whenever you're asked to discuss a choice of fuel, try and mention at least a couple of these different issues. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about is combustion. And we need to talk about complete combustion and incomplete combustion. So just to make sure we know, combustion is the scientific term for burning. And burning is just where a molecule reacts with oxygen. So complete combustion is where there is enough oxygen for the fuel to burn completely. Um, we'll talk about what the products are and how you can tell the difference. And incomplete combustion is therefore when there is not enough oxygen for the fuel to burn completely. They're pretty straightforward definitions on their own um, and we'll see what the difference is in reality. So let's have a look at combustion. So this would be complete combustion, combustion where I've got lots of oxygen. So let's start with a hydrocarbon, because these are often fuels. They've got lots of energy in them. So this one is methane. And I'm going to add lots of oxygen. So that's my oxygen that I've added. Those two things are then going to react, and they go on to make carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a product of complete combustion. So is water. So when we burn things, we make carbon dioxide and water vapour. Now the water might seem a little counterintuitive, but we really do make water vapour when you burn things. So I've just got a quick question for you. I want to see if you can uh, manage to put up the balanced equation for this reaction. And we'll have a look in class and see if you've got it. Because that's your challenge. One of many, I know. Right, so let's have a look at incomplete combustion yet. next. So... Incomplete combustion, to remind you, is when there isn't enough oxygen. So um, an example is with our Bunsen burner where the air hole's closed. Yes, this does mean we're going to get the Bunsen burners out and we'll have a little play with them and see what the difference is. So let's have a look when I burn in some oxygen. So again, I'm starting with methane. And I've got oxygen, but I haven't got as many oxygens for each methane. And this time, my... Um, Methane reacts with the oxygen to make carbon monoxide. So note there is only one oxygen here, only one oxygen, and that's what the mon means. So before we made carbon dioxide because there were two oxygens, but this has only got one oxygen because there isn't enough for both those carbons to have two oxygens. And then I still make some water. So incomplete combustion can make carbon monoxide. And now I hope you know that carbon monoxide is poisonous. It can suffocate you. So remember when we were talking about um, smoking in Biology 1, we talked about the fact that you inhale carbon monoxide and it replaces the oxygen in your blood. Uh, brownie points for anyone who can remember what the name of the bit in your red blood cells that the oxygen and the carbon monoxide binds to. You can 
tell me if you remembered when you see me. So that's uh, one form of incomplete combustion. But if I have even less oxygen this time, so I've only got one molecule of oxygen per methane, um, I just end up with carbon. And I still make water at the end, but it's just carbon on its own. So again, let's continue and challenge from the last one. Can you give me balanced sum but sum ooh, losing the ability to speak? Balanced symbol equations for these ones as well. So symbol or formula equations, it means the same thing. So as I've said, incomplete combustion can make carbon monoxide, but it can also make just carbon on its own. Now when it's just carbon on its own, it's soot. So when you get the black residue on the outside of things that when you've been burning, like on your beakers when you use the wrong flame, that's just soot and that's just the carbon that's left over. And that's one of the ways you can tell that it's incomplete combustion. Okay, so that is it for this topic. I know I've thrown a lot at you. Don't panic about these equations. We're going to practice with them. You can pass the exam even if you don't get your head around the balance in the equations. Even those of you going for the higher paper, if you are going for the higher paper, you do need to really give it a good shot though because it's very important to be able to try. The very least you need to be able to do is to have some idea of what those symbols are saying to you. Again, we will practice these in class, so don't panic. Um, and I will see you when I see you. Remember to bring me all those fantastic questions.